Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Let's Talk Automotive Season 3 and Episode 33, your only interactive automotive talk show. Welcome, everybody. In tonight's show, we have the latest news. And then Vish takes us on the test drive of the all-new Mini Countryman Cooper S. Our guest tonight is none other than the seven-time national superbike champ, Clint Seller. And then it's uh, your favorite part of the evening and one that I'm going to turn my mic off for. Game time. Well, that makes it easier. <laughs> All right, and then we move on to how things work. And tonight we're talking about CV joints. Yeah. And then uh, we can at least have somebody that's going to make me look good <laughs> with our tappet of the week. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Let's Talk Automotive. So, Mr. Full Unit, it's been a while since we've been here. It has, eh? We're going to have to uh, dust off ourselves a little bit and get rid of the rust. <laughs> <laughs> the last time we were out in the sun at the Jaguar Land Rover Experience. Yeah, it was brilliant. That it day. was a brilliant. Really good. But I see we've really started to take a back seat here, eh? Fanny. I think we need to talk to management. Yes. Uh, so, we were excluded uh, with the mini review. Yeah. So, uh -huh. Vish and Fritz got the benefit of going out and having yeah, fun. Let's, let's get yeah. that. We'll get, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. All right, let's get the show rolling and uh, let's get into this week's news. And joining us tonight is Taki, and you're going to have to help me with the surname. Taki. Bujazis. <laughs> Bujazis. <laughs> He's the business technical <laughs> manager at Motul South Africa. Thank you very much and welcome to the show. Good evening, guys, and thanks for having me on the show tonight. Awesome, man. So, in the news segment tonight, we thought that we would speak about a big news event, and uh, that happened, well, ended last week, Friday, mm. the Dakar, yeah. where Motul's heavily involved. So, that's the reason why we got Tucky on the show tonight, and uh, I think we get some insights and some, you know, sort of behind-the-scenes insight to what they do there. No, I can't wait. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible event. I think it's uh, something that's getting even more popular as the years go on, go on. So I think awesome for the viewers to be able to have a, a look at what happens behind the scenes. Absolutely. Right, Taki, so yeah, uh, let's start off with uh, just your overall thoughts on this year's Dakar. Yes, well, um, this year's Dakar was really an exciting one. Um, I think Dakar is always an exciting one from the day it starts on gluten, um, trying to catch up on every single position in all the different categories. and. Dakar is such a strange event, racing event. I mean, everybody at the moment's on such a high level, and then you've got all the navigation that plays a massive role. So, yeah, I, it was so unpredictable. You never knew what was going to happen. Some guys were out front early and then dropped back, and it, there was always a change up. Um, and the cars towards the end, we did see two guys run away with it. But, um, yeah, on the bike side, it was extremely exciting and i think it kept the the audience uh, on the edge of their seats the whole time Absolutely. not sure what not sure what's going to happen and all the drama around it i mean there was so much drama that happened so yeah, yeah a great event again and a great way to capture the audience from daco side so so talking about that taki you normally would be there so this year a bit of fomo i would say eh? Um, a bit is a bit of an understatement, um, <laughs> massive FOMO after missing this year. So last year was my first time at Dakar, um, working in the motor lab and yes, what an experience. I mean, it's, uh, it's an event on a whole nother level. Um, uh, I was there for the second week of Dakar last year and the things I learned and the people I met and just the whole community, it's, it's really an insane event. Sure, and talking about the lab, I think this is where we're going to have a nice discussion. Mm. Um, so what we've got is we've got a little bit of a video. It's a short little video to take us inside that uh, mobile lab that you guys got set up there. So if you don't mind, we're going to play that video quickly, and then we're going to come back to you with some questions. Perfect, 100%. So it all starts with a user sample. This one has just been drained off the Sherco bike that just won the stage 9 of the Dakar. 
So let's see how the oil behaves in this engine. So it's really important to do user oil analysis. Why? Because the first thing we're gonna want to check is the oil condition itself. We're gonna subject the oil to three different kinds of analysis. So the first thing we're gonna measure is uh, the oil condition itself. And I'm talking about the uh, performance enhancing additives if there is any abnormal consumption. The second thing is all the uh, wear metals that we can find in the oil. So we can find for um, gearbox or gearbox materials like iron, we can find aluminum, we can find copper, uh, we can find any sort of materials that are seen in the engine and see if there is any specific wear related. And the third thing we can, we can measure is all the pollutants coming from uh, external pollutants, like in our case, really much in Dakar, the sand. So all these analyses are done here on the, in the motor racing lab. It's a, it's a mobile lab that is following all the stages of the Dakar. The idea is to be present every day in the bivouac before the uh, riders come back from the stages. Taki, that is so impressive, man. And you guys actually uh, gave the media a, a, a virtual tour um, of the bivouac mm -hmm. and inside and showed us around a little bit uh, at the uh, second last day of the Dakar. Um, and that stood out for me so much. You know, the, the lab that you guys got going and then the work that you do, it's totally unbelievable. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, that lab and what you guys do? Perfect. So the big focus about the lab is more to provide the extra service to the customers and the races at Dakar. Um, and it's, a, it's open service uh, that we offer to everybody racing DACO. So even those that aren't using Motul are welcome to use the service. Um, and the focus with the service is to help all the competitors understand the health of the engine. I think the best way I can relate is almost that the engine oil is very similar to like blood in a person. So you do analysis and you can pick up what's going on, what might be going wrong, and almost preempt a failure. So maybe on stage eight we pick up that the engine's wearing abnormally and we can warn the rider and say like maybe look at this or try to stop this um in certain cases take a penalty and swap an engine instead of running the risk of failure so that they can get to the finish line and then the second compo component of the dakar uh, lab or i mean our mobile lab it also goes through to motor gps and lamar um is to just improve our products all the time so We've, we've got a, a full range of cutting edge technology products, but we always try and improve them. And we can see uh, just by analyzing the different products after the harsh stages, what's happening in the engine. So we could see how those products hold out, how they re uh, uh, resist the heat and the pressures that they might encounter out on the stage and find some form of improvement going forward that we can bring down into our full commercial range that's available to everybody. I and mean, even the, the products that the factory teams are racing at Dakar 300 V-Line is a specific racing product and that's also available to everybody in the public. So Taki, I mean, I think you've answered the question that I was going to ask um, in terms of this lab service is available to everyone. So I take it that, is it available to everyone for free or, or do, do the teams have to subscribe to a particular package to be part of this? No, it's, so that, this is a, just a service that we offer free of charge to everybody at Dakar. I think everybody Everybody has money to get to Dakar already, so <laughs> if we can just help them get to the finish line, it makes a massive difference. And it also allows us to see how our oil is performing against competitors, and that's always some nice insight that we can, we can dig into. Oh, amazing. That's amazing. Right, so Taki, um, one thing that, that was very um, interesting for me and, and something that I thought about while we were watching that virtual um, uh, tour that you guys took us on. Are you guys involved with uh, all the teams or are you more involved with the bikes or some some cars or is it is it a specific type of guys that you that you go on on tour with? So we involved with everybody at Dakar um, from the bikes all the way up to the trucks. Um, the big focus is uh, uh, starts at the original by motor uh, category, the old Male Moto, where the riders have to service and do everything for themselves. We support them majorly. Um, the motor team actually sleeps in the same tents that they sleep in, has the same kit and everything. And then we also support them in 
just trying to advise where we can. We're not allowed to work on bikes, obviously, but just giving them some extra support while they're out there. Um, then we also are deeply involved with certain factory teams like uh, Sherco Factory Racing and the uh, Monster Energy Honda team, HRC. Uh, but then moving out of that into the other categories, I mean, we're involved with the side-by-sides like the South Racing Can-Am team and the factory team. And then certain car teams, we, we spend a lot of time working with them. And the nice thing with the Motul uh, Lab is we're not just work we we can't it's not just engine oil that we can analyze i mean we can look at gear well well automatic transmission fluid we can give them some information across everything so like for the the srt team that uh, the seridori team that was running the century cr6 we're involved with them um and then if we look at the truck side rick rick rally that um r- races a man truck throughout that car Yes, I think they've been there every single edition. They've got yeah. massive motor on the side of the truck. <laughs> and, yeah, we're heavily involved across the board because this helps us see how our products perform at the highest of levels. And this information is carried over. So if we need to make an improvement, we can. And, yeah, that's what's available to your average person in, in the shop. They can buy the same oil that these guys are running at DACO. I think that's an important point, yeah, actually, exactly. is that, you know, uh, even uh, with myself, I've always imagined Motul to be a very niche product that, I don't know why I thought this, but that was racing. really only available to kind of teams that were racing and that yeah. type of thing. I never realized that there was that, that, that kind of a spread of a net in terms yeah. of the product offering to the consumer at the end of the day. Mm. And I think, uh, Tucky, you can maybe also explain um, the fact that you guys do have relationships with some of the, the OEMs and also maybe a bit of a, a, a look forward to the new strategies that, that Motul have in South Africa, especially from a distribution point of view. Perfect. Well, yeah, i um, always been heavily invested in everything from cutting, drilling, and then filling the engine. So from engine production all the way through the lifespan of the engine, we've got product. So even for your industrial range, we've got a full range of product. But then, um, like for your vehicle range, I mean, Porsche South Africa's Motul as a service for and we've got quite big ties with uh, various workshops uh, around the country and that's a big a big focus for us is to grow the Motul brand in every single aspect. We've got certain fleets running on Motul um, and that was also a, a challenge initially that you'd introduce a product to a fleet manager that races bikes, uses Motul in his bike but what, didn't even know that Motul has a truck engine well. And, mm. The way we do this is we just show some performance benefits of the product, reduced wear, better fuel economy, and just overall lifespan of the engine. So it's always bringing our niche product that we have into the bigger scale and trying to benefit people in every single way. And in the last Motul has turned uh, or changed a lot. Uh, we've taken on a direct distribution model uh, or a bit of a hybrid distribution model, but uh, working with it, people around me to try grow the brand and yeah it, it's it's really taken off i mean we've got major support you'll find a lot of uh, the midas is a stocking motel now and a big aspect that we also bring into the market is education and that's a massive role that i, I play um and a big part of my job is actual training i've got a thing called motel school that I train people on our products, but not only our products, on oil in general. So yes. from the public to the salespeople, so that if you walk into a Midas store, for example, and you want to purchase oil, you're not sure what a 10W40 or a 5W30 and what API number. And so these guys have been through training and can give you a bit of extra insight to get the right lubricant for your car. Wow, well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Tucky, so much. And I think that's uh, certainly one of the things that we're going to be looking forward to uh, moving forward is to have you as a more of a regular feature on our show so that we can really put that brain of yours to the, to, to the test and, and start to, to actually educate some of our viewers on, on, on some of the science behind oil. No, no, perfect. You guys was just shout. I'm always happy to awesome. try and um, help out and give some additional information across. Excellent. Thanks, Tucky. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for joining us on Let's Talk Automotive. Have a good week. Perfect. Thanks, you guys. Have a great weekend and uh, yeah, chat soon. Thanks, Thanks Tucky. Cheers, well. All right, Peter. So uh, now it's time to bitch and moan. <laughs> yes, because as we alluded to in the beginning of the show, 
we got left out again. Yeah, again. but not, not, not only got left out, we got left out of going to Makalali Game Reserve, a five-star hotel and game reserve. So, uh, yeah, I'm not too happy about this, but uh, <laughs> let's get... Yeah, I'm looking, to, I'm looking to my right because Vish is sitting right here and the producer that went with him is sitting right there. So, not happy about this. But anyway, guys, this is our review of the week, the Mini Countryman Cooper S. Hi, and welcome everybody to Let's Talk Automotive. We found ourselves at the Makalali Lodge here in the lovely Low Felt, getting to experience the new Mini Countryman Cooper S. The cool part about this car is, it's actually a Mini and a crossover. So what better opportunity than perhaps to actually take it off-road? We looked at following the trail vehicle all the way here, which not many people would attempt, but it proved really competent and it changed our opinion completely of this car and I'll tell you why. Seeing as we missed the official launch of the Mini, we were given the opportunity to come and shoot our experience here at Makalali's private game lodge. What is really cool for us was that myself and Fritz got into the Mini yesterday and we took a slow relaxed drive out here. It's 410 kilometers from Pretoria so it's not a short trip and it's not extremely long. I think we made good time in this vehicle as it eats up the distance quite comfortably. The Mini presents itself actually very well balanced. It's larger than the old Countryman and even with my six foot frame and Fritz's we fit it quite comfortably with our camera equipment for the long trip. What was very interesting for us was that the vehicle actually consumes very little fuel at our national speed limit. The cool part in this is the ground clearance of this car, which initially I kind of thought, okay, crossover, how relevant is it? I mean, can we really call it a crossover if we can't do proper off-road? So we were quite surprised when we decided, well, let's just follow the game vehicle through because it was just moving luggage and equipment. And we were treated on the off-road trail to a group of lions that kind of also wanted to see what the Mini looked like, because it's obviously very odd to see a vehicle of this stature struggling through the mud, rocks, and all sorts of obstacles that you would normally experience. On arriving at the bottom lodge, which is where the holding area is, where people park their normal vehicles, we thought, well, after asking one of the rangers, do you think this vehicle can make it all the way to the top lodge? And he says, you could try. And we did. And we followed him up on this gravel dirt road. The vehicle proved competent. Of course, it does have electronically assisted all-wheel drive, which by its very nature means that even with slippage, you'll be able to work your way through most obstacles. What we found really interesting about this car was that initially when I looked at the rims, I thought, okay, it's very close to the electric Mini. But I must admit, it grows on you the further you actually delve into its architecture. We found ourselves traveling across some potholed experiences of our landscape. And the suspension held and handled it much better than we thought. Driving on the N4, I expected more from this engine. But one's got to consider that they've added almost four cement bags of weight to it to make it more stable. And if you look at it, you can actually see the car looks very solid. It actually looks well planted and it composed, it's composed and it handles itself well in that respect. What I missed was our ability to downshift with paddles. I mean, where this car sits from a pricing point of view, one would expect that as a natural, where I found myself having to, I was virtually reaching for pedals which were not there. I think that was something that somehow with an S version you need it, especially if you're going to go faster around corners where the Mini as the old-fashioned go-kart of note was well respected. With this new Mini there were slight changes. Certain ones that made me grumpy and certain ones that had me grinning like an idiot. Let's start with the grinning like an idiot bit. If one looked at the lights, you've seen that they've, they've actually mapped 
the entire Union Jack look. So the vehicle from the back would, looks absolutely spectacular. My issue internally, and again I go back to the pedals or the missing pedals, is also the clocks. Everybody was used to a circular clock. Now you've got this weird kind of stick on LED for, for me somewhere between a motorbike and a touch screen. Doesn't work for me, but that's just my opinion. For us as the Let's Talk Automotive team, the amazing experience of the Mini Cooper S combined with the luxury within this environment of Makalali's five-star lodge allowed us to look at the vehicle in a completely new light. It allowed us a practical experience within the low felt offering of Bush felt living. What we must add is that the Mini itself ticks quite a few boxes. The biggest ones being that, pardon the pun, the space that it represents allows it to actually become a family vehicle now, whereas before it was very much two plus two cats. From us as the Let's Talk Automotive team, we'd like to extend a warm thank you to BMW South Africa for the use of this vehicle and the Makalali Lodge team for their incredible hospitality and amazing friendliness. This is Vishnu Singh signing out. See you soon. All right, and straight into our guest of the week, Clinton Sello. Welcome to Let's Talk Automotive. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Thanks, yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having awesome. me. Awesome. Final thoughts on that car? I, you know what? I can see now why we're being left out of these things because that actually was a stunning production. It I've got was, to say, it was so well done. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's our faces. Is that yeah, what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, it could be okay, your cool. face. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave me out of that. Eh? All right, let's get into Clinton Seller, seven-time national superbike champion. That's a mouthful. Yeah, when are you going <laughs> to give somebody else a chance? <laughs> when I retire. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so maybe just get, tell us how you got into the racing scene, it's particularly on bikes. Because a lot of people would tend to want to go karting and then into cars. That's so uh, I actually did. Uh, I went the karting route um, many, many years ago. Uh, I used to, I did mo dabble motocross and then my dad didn't like the fact that his car got dirty every weekend. <laughs> so I um, went go-karting. That's what I did. You know, GP Juniors, 100 stock. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah, I sort of, from my side, I, w I wanted to ride motorbikes. I saw motorbikes at the track. And I mean, these are the guys mm -hmm. that I race against now that I saw back then at the track, at the go-kart track at SWAT Corps, and um, put my dad under immense amount of pressure. And then he eventually bought me a, a GSX-R600 Suzuki. Okay. And uh, man, I wrote it off in my first ever race. <laughs> but uh, my dad still came to me and said, oh, okay, you've, you've put a big hole in your elbow now, stitches, hospital. Okay, can we get over this motorbike thing? And I was like, Dad, did you see how fast I was before? I <laughs> and that was it, you know what I mean? And Excellent. sort of uh, progressed uh, quite quickly to getting, you know, sort of a, a ride where you got paid a little bit of money. And then, you know, always the overseas goal was always there. Mm. As a youngster, I think uh, now I'm a bit past it. But uh, yeah, I still dabble a little bit of overseas stuff now even, yeah. Awesome. And I mean, uh, just to jump in quickly, I mean, uh, we can't forget the dads and the parents that are Absolutely. really always behind the successful Race, race drivers and, and riders. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, the sacrifice from your, from your family time, um, you know, for me, it was, it was really special time because my dad and I got to spend time that when I looked at my friends, they, you know, their dad was the guy that came home and they saw on the weekend a little mm, bit, yeah. you know, whereas I sort of was at hotels with my dad and we were at the racetrack and we had goals together. So for me, it was the family time was unbelievably special Fantastic. and, uh, you know, turned out in a few wins as well, which also makes it yeah. cool. Magic, <laughs> magic. Right, I want to jump in here and uh, talk to you guys watching the show. Remember that this is an interactive show and you guys can actually ask your questions or give your comments, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, on race day, on Let's Talk Automotive Spade, wherever, please interact with us and give us your thoughts. In fact, Sorry, we've yeah. got a question from a viewer. Yes, already. we've got one here from Keith Buerta, mm. uh, the bearded man. <laughs> <laughs> right, Keith wants to know, Clinton, he says, uh, well, first of all, how do you feel on the Honda and the testing that you've done? So let's start with that. So we still had like a super limited stage in testing. I've only actually ridden the bike in its 100% stock format. Okay. Um, but really pulled a lot of positives from that. The big thing now is, is the new Honda makes a lot of power. Yeah. You know, and I think that's been a box that they haven't been able to tick for a few years. And now it abundantly ticks that box. Yes. So um, a lot of excitement from me from that aspect. 
um, from the fact that it handles like a Honda as well. You know, Honda is, it's so homing, so comforting, yes. um, gives you so much confidence. So when, you, when you're looking towards how the race package is going to be, which uh, we're still about, about a month away from, from getting sorted out, uh, you know, importing parts right yeah. now is taking Difficult, so long. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but um, so very comforted uh, um, by the feelings that I've gotten thus far. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and the second part of his question was uh, maybe also ask him about the lack of national riders on the grid. Yeah, that is, you know, honestly, uh, that is the question that I get asked probably the most by everyone from from social media to people that you see at at days when you're doing testing and things. Yeah, yeah. It is a massive challenge. You know, yesterday I was actually in a meeting with with all the head on shows that run motorcycling in South Africa from from the new Yamaha R3 Cup all the way through to our SASBK series. And um, you know, we we are trying. I'm now sort of come on as the riders' representative to to give a feedback from a riding point of view as well as you know i run my own team as well yes. now the king price extreme team so you know i can i can give feedback from both of those angles we're trying a few things and uh you know there's there's a lot of guys with bikes out there it is an expensive sport there's no question about that but they are really w willing to work with guys and okay. and you know particularly you say you know a guy will be like oh you know this rule doesn't work for me we saying you know what the top echelon guys, myself, David McFadden, Sheridan Marias, um, Garrick Flock, the guys who are running in the front of the championship, we're going to have to stick to really stringent rules, which are the current national championship rules. But let's open up the rules for guys that are looking to maybe join our series, but, you know, maybe bikes don't conform to, or their Aye. comfort levels don't conform yeah. to the very strict rules that we work in Aye. and get the guys on the grid and you know once they're on the grid it gives us an opportunity to have a future with them and, and build our national series that's, that's a positive i mean w would it be unfair of me to say that it's maybe also to do with the fact that there's a lot of guys out there that aren't prepared to earn their stripes through the regional series first and want to jump straight into nationals and then find it such a such an expensive um, series to to race and it shocks them. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's absolutely. You know, years when when I first started, the regional series was was forty bikes deep in the super sport class, and you know you you had national guys coming across that you were sort of looking at, and you sort of it was worthwhile to go there and spend the money and build up there. Whereas now, um, you know, the regional classes are not as strong and. You very rarely do you find a national guy. In fact, I haven't raced a, a regional race in oh, 10 years, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so we don't go across there. And that's mainly because, you know, it costs the same amount of money to run a regional as it does yeah, to run yeah. a national sometimes. So when budgets are um, as tight and as stringent as what they are, mm. we have to put the focus into really um, important test days. And then, then at the national, you know, obviously yeah. doing, doing the big show there. So yeah, it is difficult. Um, it's hard for for guys, for families to fund it now. But um, you know, there's there's new things that I think, uh, particularly, will, will will be coming in the next year and year and a half, where I think you're going to see a middleweight class in South Africa that's a national championship that is on bikes that are well priced. Rules are quite standard. Mm -hmm. Where you're going to see guys going, you know what? Instead of climbing on the superbike to come race me who's been doing it my whole life, yeah. and the big budgets that that takes, they can maybe come in in a middleweight class, get a bit of manufacturer support, you know, come in at a reasonable price, and be there on the same day. And like I was, I used to sit and look at Russell Wood and be like, oh, when he mm. put on his helmet, I'd put on my helmet. <laughs> when he put on his gloves, I put on my gloves because I was watching him, you know. And uh, they can do that on the same day that we there, you know, and, and that'll not only bring the bring the real top talent through, it'll yeah. also give the guy something to look at and be like, you know, I want to be on the King Price team. Yes, Man, yes. I want to see, look at their pits and those things. 100%. And that's how I was. And that's, you know, why, why I kept doing it and plugging away. Tying, tying into that, um, what would you say or advice would you give the youngsters at this stage that want to get into this? Because that's where we need to start, with the youngsters again. So how do we get the youngsters back at the track and, and racing? That's it. You know, for me, it's, it's back at the track. You exactly said that. You know, uh, for the youngsters, being at the mall and mm. uh, smoking around the corner <laughs> seems like the cool thing. But uh, there's nothing cooler and works so much better for the girls when you're winning races <laughs> on mobiles. So those folks think they're cool, but they're yeah. not cool in the long run. So, you know, when the kids are at the track, they're at the track on Saturday morning, bright and early with their family and their dad. And they're doing something that, 
not only physically exerting and, and, and keeps you away from trouble and out of that because you've got to train and all that, yeah. but please believe me, it works a lot better than those <laughs> oaks that are smoking in the corner. You know? So uh, bring the, uh, keep the youngsters at the track, the, the junior series, yeah. and then I think you'll see that, and any parents and any sponsor will see you know, someone that has a talent, like yes. you know, Brad Binder. I mean, yes. he, his talent was immense as a youngster, and then you know, his family saw that and said, you know what, let's sacrifice. Let's get this guy over. Yeah. Mm. And if, if the kids are at the track and you're pushing for that, the potential is that that, that can happen. All right. Mm. Well, you've mentioned, sorry, Pete, you've mentioned uh, the King Price connection. So yeah. tell us a bit about the, the King Price Extreme team and tell us about the, the riders that you have involved and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so the King Price uh, Extreme team was, it's actually my team. So it's, so it's run under Seller Racing, under, okay. under my team. And, uh, you know, I was really, in, in 2018, the team that I was racing for um, closed doors. And it was a case of, well, do I retire? And my wife, we were lying in bed, and she said, you know, wouldn't it be cool to give a kid, even if it's one, yeah. the chance that you got when you were 15 years old and you earned a bit of money racing and uh, has helped our life, you know, where my wife and I are in our lives uh, um, today, you know, those things and the connections I made from racing has helped us. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if you give even just one kid that chance? And I was like, oh, you know, racing so expensive. How do you find someone to pay for it? And she was like, ask. And uh, <laughs> it's so funny, I went to King Price, Liquid Molly, Dragon Energy, Fire It Up, and I was like, hey guys, you know, uh, if I go racing, will you give me some money to do it? <laughs> and every single person I went to said, you know what, Clint, we'll stick with you for a year. If you do what you say, we can go further. And awesome. um, yeah, I mean, we're in the third year of the team. Every sponsor that I started with, um, the biggest sponsors, obviously yeah, smaller yeah. ones have changed over the sure. years, you know, for parts and things. But every sponsor I started with with the team has, has every year stayed with me and we've had growth. And yeah. I think that that's because, you know, uh, the, the team I started was myself and Dino Yotzel. Yeah. And Dino was a, an awesome young talent that was with the team and a great kid. And now he's moving to Europe. And, uh, and he's going over to Europe racing in the IDM championship for, for a year, you know, fully focused on that. And now um, I moved last year, I moved Sofiso up with me. Yeah. And Sofiso is a guy that has an incredible media profile, but is raw. I mean, yeah. he came from riding on the road two years ago. Yes. And sort of now working with him. And, you know, I think sometimes uh, I, uh, I'm overly harsh when I work with him <laughs> in the sense I'm like, man, just get on with it. Yeah. But his riding I've, in a year is taking huge steps with sure. us and our team. And now we've got Lungo. And Lungo is a real youngster, again, also raw but super, super fast. Yes. And I think um, seeing those two guys, it excites me having the young team that we have that's going to run the short circuit series with, with Lungo and then myself and, and Sofiso on the big bike series. And, you know, the, the goal is one day I can retire, be a team manager. Sure. And there's, there'll be a guy that takes over my spot and keeps the number one stripe in front, yeah. of the, in front of the bike. Yeah, that's the goal. I mean, one of the things that I'm definitely hearing loud and clear here is that for a successful relationship with your sponsor, um, you've, you've got to be able to add serious value to that sponsor. And the sponsor, by the way, has got to add value back to you as well. Correct. And I think maybe one of the, the rookie mistakes that a lot of the youngsters make is that even if they do manage to get sponsorships, unfortunately, they don't handle it properly. They don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to manage it. And they end up just messing it up. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, a, it's literally like a job. And it's not a job because it's, it's hard. It's a job because you've got to constantly be on top of yeah. it. Yeah. You know, the days of, cool, well, throw a stick on my bike, <laughs> you know, yeah. and yeah. give me a bunch of money. Those days are gone. You yeah. know, the, there's the social media side of things yeah. and, and managing that, but also working for your sponsor. And one of the big things that I say in, in any sponsorship meeting with any of my sponsors and my team is... Guys, it is what you put into it mm -hmm. is what you get out. Giving me a bunch of money and saying, cool, let me know if you're doing something, yeah. it doesn't work. Whereas if they go, okay, cool, we want to be at that event. We want our customer, our fan base to be at those events with you. How can we work with you? You know, Clint, we, wanna, we hear you in the interview. We're going to grab that on our page and share yes. it and work mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do an event. Please bring your bikes with and put up your, your big race pit. Yeah. If you're doing those with a sponsor, there's always constant value. And the fact is that motorbike racing is cool. Yeah. You know, it, it yes. is. It's yes. really cool. It's exciting. It's like big, expensive, fancy bikes and risks and high speeds. 
So your average person, when they see one of those bikes, their eyes are immediately drawn to it and attracted to it. Mm. So the more times that, that your sponsor can engage with you and work with you, and, and I really see that with, with all of my sponsors. In fact, on, on Monday, um, I'm doing a TV or, or a sort of a video shoot with Dragon Energy, and in the middle of the shoot, I have to leave to go do a Facebook live interview with Liquid <laughs> Molly with the team to get back and finish up the Dragon one. But that's the sponsors. Yeah. They're wanting us and the team to be involved and by doing that is growing both the riders and the team, but as well as, as showing their brand and, and they, you know, growing their audience, mm. which I think is so cool. And I mean, I, I, I've got to say, you know, the, the, we, the reality is, is that motorsport in South Africa has been sick for a while, yep. but the green shoots that we're starting to see are with teams like yourselves. I mean, we spoke to Terence Marsh from Redline, and he's another character that also gives amazing um, sort of value for money for his sponsors. And then the Oates brothers that we had on the show yeah. recently as well. They, yeah. They're great examples of how it can be done and hopefully are shining beacons for sponsors to take a second look at motorsport and say, hang, hang on a second, if we do it properly, we can actually make this mm. thing work. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. It really can. It really right, can. So getting back to the racing, uh, something that, that I think about often when I watch these guys on MotoGP and whatever the case is, how do you guys, because obviously you, you don't do this full-time, full-time, you've got a proper job as well, not yeah. just fun all I the wish, time. I wish, but yeah. <laughs> but how do you prepare mentally and physically to go out and, and race at these levels? Yeah, so the physical side is, is, is the one that you do every day. You know, that's the one that you, that you do every day. In fact, I wish I didn't have a normal job so I could do it a bit more. <laughs> but having said that, I, I had my time when, when I was a bit younger and I only raced motorbikes. Yes. And I probably was a bit lazy, but you know, <laughs> knowing that now. But I mean, the physical side, yeah, every day, you know, you normal you gym do, and all that. Yeah. Sort of so stuff. I've, uh, you know, I've got a two-year-old daughter. So for <laughs> me, going to the gym for for an hour and a half, I don't want to do it. Yeah. You know. So uh, I've actually kind of built up a, a bit of equipment at my house that okay. that works for me, how I train and how yes. I like to to exercise. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, I head out in the treadmill and smash out in the treadmill. My daughter has a little stand next to me and steals my water and all those <laughs> things. But that's, for me, what works on, on my side. But it's, it's literally an everyday thing. You know, yes. like it's an everyday, you finish your job, drive home, and then you know, you know, okay, cool. I'm going to be on this thing for an hour sure. and uh, knock that out. The mental side, I think, I think it's easier for me actually having a job then it might be for like a Brad Binder or someone at a MotoGP. I have yeah, never yeah. been there, so I don't know. But, you know, when I go, for example, when I go race the World Endurance Series, I get to be away from my job. I get to be away from, from that side. So it's so exciting and cool for me yeah, yeah. that, you know, the, the major stress and anxiety that, that is normally associated with the race weekend, I actually have to sit back and go, <laughs> you know what? Like someone's paying me to ride a motorbike. <laughs> you know, let's enjoy that. And I think uh, sometimes yeah. that can come out in, you know, how you how you ride the motorbike. You know, sure. you actually sometimes just having a lot of fun. You know, yes. you're actually enjoying what you're doing. And then you know, sometimes the lap time arrives quite yeah, quickly. Yeah. yeah. Now you mentioned your wife just now in terms of uh, the discussion you had about developing um, a, a race team. Obviously, support structure is critical. Whether it's your wife, your family, uh, your parents. Uh, tell us about your support system and especially how does your wife support you? Yeah, so uh, my wife, uh, I don't even think she likes motorcycles, to be <laughs> honest. Um, if I'm truly honest, I don't think she likes motorcycles, but she likes me to be happy. And she knows that motorcycle and racing makes me happy. But also, um, she does drive me. You know, she knows that if I, if I don't perform because I haven't done the work off the racetrack, it's going to make me upset. So it's easier to say to me, you know, love, I know you like lying on the couch, but you know you have to go have a ride or have a run or have a row or whatever it is. And uh, so she keeps me motivated in, in that aspect. But, um, you know, from, from when I was a kid, I had my mum and my dad, my dad with me. He was my mechanic, suspension mechanic, fall off, scream at me mechanic, <laughs> whatever it was. And, and I had, you know, that, that family backing. And even when, when I was overseas and even going overseas now, I still have my dad who phones every single day, my wife who phones more on the human level, yeah. whereas my dad will phone and be like, okay, cool, what's the lap time like, how's the bike feel, <laughs> you know, how many laps are you doing, what are the sessions like, who's fast, who's this, yeah, yeah. whereas my wife, like, it's actually cooler because on the human level, she'll phone me and be like, oh, Mila did this today, yeah. and, you know, did that, and, you know, that also takes it away, sure. and so you, that balance, uh, you know, so I, I, you can never say you have the perfect balance, but I feel... 
I get to enjoy it the most the way I've kind of got it, you know, awesome. and, and seeing guys with their family, you know, uh, uh, when I look at guys, Johnny Ray, if you look at him with his family, yeah. you can almost see that, that his family life has improved his motorcycle riding because there's that in extreme balance. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think, um, thanks for that. I appreciate your time, but we are now coming to my favorite part of uh. the show and it's called game time. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Clint, I've thrown you in the deep end here. Sorry about that, but I'm going to explain the rules, and you guys at home can also join in this game. It's called Guess the Car, but tonight it's called Guess the Bike. All right, so how this works is we're going to show you a partial of a motorcycle, okay? Yeah. And then you have to guess the bike, all right? There's seven bikes. Don't, don't, don't start, Peter. <laughs> don't start, just wait. Okay, there's seven bikes, yeah. all right? You have to shout your name. Very important. Shout your name if you recognize. I don't remember my name. Yes, Jesus. just <laughs> shout your name if you recognize the bike, and I'll come to you, and then we can take it from there. How do you feel about that, Peter? So what I was going to ask is, um, I see in um, football and rugby they have a substitution system. Yeah. Um, I think I injured my ankle. Can I please call Vish in to substitute for me? Vish, come help, Peter. <laughs> Vish, come help, Peter. <laughs> Let's see if this helps, because Peter's. We've done 33 episodes. Peter's one, two. No, you can, no, you can, no, just, just <laughs> yeah, stand no, no. there, just I mean, stand there. And that's on cars, here. which I know, <laughs> no, allegedly, just, No, you can bikes. just stand there, you can just stand there and yeah, help you. You to, Yeah, you don't have to mic up, oh, just, just on your haunches there, okay. So it's <laughs> Vish. long, so you feel nice and tired. <laughs> <in the spot. laughs> so, so it's Vish and Peter versus, do you want me to help you, because I've got yeah. the answers. Okay. Actually, I can see the All right, okay, guys, here we go. Here comes the first one. We're going is back that a Harley Davidson? Peter, Harley Davidson. No, you're wrong. Like, like, uh, the color th gives it away so badly, it's stupid. Oh, it's like a R90 BMW. Or BMW like is that. good yeah. enough. It's an R32. Well done. R32. Oh, an R. I had a <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, one for Clint. That is a 1923 model, by the way. Okay, sure. they're not all that well, old. Yes. This is this is just after Peter was born. <laughs> 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 All right, one, two, Clint, and here comes the second one. Ducati. Okay, uh, Peter. <laughs> okay, but now Ducati. Yes, it's a Ducati. Boom. Yeah, but which one? Come on. Nine uh, nine six. Mm. Or 918. No. 916. Yes! 916. Clint's got it. <laughs> it was one of those three. Uh, Clint's got it. My dad had one. My dad had one. It's nice, eh? Really that was where it was launched. How that awesome is that? Yeah, yes. that Can okay, we get a point two, for that instance? Yeah. Two, two, <laughs> no. Two, two, for Clint, <laughs> two for Clint, zero for Team Peter and Vish. Oh, and terrible. here comes the third one. Peter. Honda. Oh, yeah, sorry. Now you need to shout your name. Oh, sorry, that's I'll come to you, Peter. Honda, yeah. It's a Honda what? Clint gave you the Red answer. Hot. No, I could see it written on the yes, side. Oh, is it on the, side? Oh, on the, the side? Yes, yeah, it's a Honda. But which one, man? We can't say it's a Honda. I don't know. This Ancient is bike. Ca Cafe Racer. There's a, there's a tip. The most converted bike into Cafe Racers. Can I try? Like you can try? Go. CB750. Absolutely. Yeah. Clint. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, just look at that. I think I can that. see 750. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's 750 on that side. Yeah, I was going to say CB1000. I, I, I okay, I'll give, you half, point. I'll give you half a point. I'll half give you half a point. point. Sure. Okay. We, we're <laughs> on the scoreboard. Uh, <laughs> okay. Remember, I used to sell motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Now we're getting to a very interesting one. Clint, you should get this quite easily. Here's the fourth one. Yamaha, Clint. Yes, Yamaha Clint. Yeah, Yamaha Absolutely. 1990. Yeah. This is 90, 98 model. 98. Yeah, I actually had, that was my first Really? Bike. Yeah. I, had had a, I was 13, 1998. And yeah. those two, two back, those lights. Those yes. Lights, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Very nice. Okay, three and a half to Clint and half oh. to Peter and Vish. Well done, guys. You guys are doing well. Shooting the lights. All right, here <laughs> comes the fifth one. Clint? Yes, Clint. What Suzuki? is it? Yes. Uh, I'm going to give you half a point for Suzuki. Yeah, GSX. 500? No. no 750? Yes, 750. 750. 750. Yes, like guys. Are, wow. you, are you watching, guys? Yeah. No. Peter, are you here? Yeah. Classic. I'm, I'm classic kind of bike helping. there. I'm kind of yeah. helping with the <laughs> He's helping. Yeah, he's helping me. Yeah, you're, you're supposed to be my teammate. Okay, the guys at home. Sofiso, I, I Sofiso is playing with. Marius yeah. is playing with. M is playing with. Johannes is watching with us. Guys, bring your answers. Where are we now? It's number six, eh? Hey? Number six, here we go. Okay. 
Oh, uh, Honda. Glint. Yes, Glint. Honda CBR 1000. Uh, half a point so far. Yeah, it's a 900. I'm going to give you half a point yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is, so that's CBR 900, yeah. Yes, that's sure. the CBR 900. Jeez, okay. yeah. That's okay, a so, back so, 900. Yeah. Yeah, so I that think. is a 92 model. 5.1. 5.1, going so into the last one. one. <laughs> All right, here comes the last one, guys. And this is a 1957 model of what? Uh, Peter, Harley Davidson. Harley. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Um, soft tail. No. Hard oh, tail. Man. No. <laughs> no tail. I don't know any Harleys. <laughs> <laughs> like a Harley flathead or something like that. <laughs> I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Peter yeah. a consolation take point. A full, here. Take a it's full the point. <laughs> the Sportster. Oh. Uh, it's a 1957 Sportster. Isn't that a beautiful bike? Sure. Oh. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> lean well though. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not a big Harley uh, fans on the panel tonight, but anyway. You think? Yes, actually the the producer just put in my ear that the score actually doesn't matter because Peter lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're very, very happy. Oh, thanks, right. Fish. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah, you were much help. <laughs> no, no help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. That, that brings us to the end of the interview. Clint, thank you so much for you guys, King Price, all your sponsors for joining us. It was absolutely awesome having you on the show. Thanks, yeah. guys. Appreciate thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you on the track again. Awesome. You can Thanks stay you can awesome. stay right there. We're going to introduce the next segment and it's called How Things Work and tonight we're talking about CV joints. Yeah. The much underrated mechanical device that has made it possible for us for example to have front wheel drive vehicles. All right guys, this is How Things Work and this is proudly brought to you by Suzuki Auto South Africa. Welcome to Let's Talk Automotive and in this episode on how things work we're going to be taking you through a remarkable mechanical device that we found in our vehicles called a CV joint. Now the CV joint has allowed designers to design amazing products in our vehicles such as front wheel drive vehicles as well as the application of independent rear suspensions on our vehicles. So we're going to take you through the remarkable design of a CV joint. But before we get there, I want to have a little bit of a step back and look at the CV joint's granddaddy, which is the universal joint. Now the universal joint we've often seen working in conjunction with a prop shaft on a rear wheel drive vehicle, particularly on a bucky for example. And its job is to transfer torque and to transfer that torque through at least two angles. Now as a UV joint, which is also known as a cardan joint, was in fact discovered some 300 years BC by the Greeks. However, it was Italian mathematician Gerolamo Cardano who actually rediscovered it in the 1500s and used it in some industrial applications. Now, as we've said, the UV joint works well on prof shafts, but it does have some shortcomings. The first is, is it has a minimum working angle. And the second is it suffers from velocity fluctuations. Now I'm going to explain both of those. So first of all, the maximum working angle unfortunately restricts the UV joint in terms of the higher the speed that the UV joint is operating at, the less angle that we can have acting on the UV joint. The velocity fluctuations actually occur four times per rotation of the UV joint. And this is due to the design of the UV joint and the cross and yoke part of the UV joint. And at the end caps of the cross and yoke, you'll find that those end caps during a rotation actually have to travel either a further or shorter distance during each rotation. And this occurs every 90 degrees. Now, we can mitigate that with a process called phasing of the UV joints. So what we do is at each end of the prop shaft, we simply phase the UV joints at each end out of phase by 90 degrees and that tends to kind of cancel out each other's vibrations. However, I must say that the middle of the shaft still does suffer from this velocity fluctuation and we see this emanating in the form of vibrations, particularly at higher rotation speeds on our commercial vehicles. So it really only tends towards getting constant velocity at the end of the day. So not good enough for our front wheel drive drive shafts that we're going to be talking about now. 
So we don't, in fact, achieve true constant velocity with the universal joint. And that is why, with the front-wheel drive vehicle, we use a CV joint. And that, in fact, should give you a clue as to what CV stands for, which is constant velocity. So a constant velocity or CV joint truly gives us an accurate transfer of velocity from the output shaft through to the input shaft, and those two velocities never fluctuate. So we don't get additional vibrations from our CV joint. And this is why it is so successful in front-wheel drive cars. So it overcomes the typical shortcomings of universal joints and the typical layout that we have with our CV joints on a prop shaft is inboard and outboard joints. So I have in my hand here an example of an outboard joint, which is the part that actually butts up and joins with the wheel itself. And as we can see, the way it works is, is that we have six ball bearings we have an inner and an outer housing and those ball bearings are held in place with a cage. There are also these tracks that you can see here that allow the ball bearings to physically move up and down. And it's those tracks and these two housings that actually allow the drive shaft to now move in two different angles. The first angle that it compensates for is due to the fluctuation in suspension height and the second angle is due to the steering angle that we find on the front wheels. And the CV joint can cope with both of those angles simultaneously and, by the way, with a high degree of angle that is applied to it with no fuss whatsoever. The inboard CV joint is a lot simpler compared to the outer. And, in fact, it's called a plunging ball type because all it's really got to cope with is the fluctuation in suspension height and at the end of the day it's just a fancy slip joint. Now when it comes to the maintenance of CV joints there's not much you can do to physically maintain a CV joint other than making sure that your car is serviced regularly and that the critical grease that is applied to the CV joint is replaced on time. Now there are in fact two types of grease that we use with our CV joints so there's a different grease that's used with our inboard CV joint and that grease is designed to offer thermal protection to the joint because you can imagine there's a lot of heat transfer that occurs from the transmission to the inner CV joint. The outer CV joint, the grease that we use there is really more to promote correct lubrication of this joint so that it offers up less resistance when it is turning as well as with the angles. Now, as a matter of wear and tear, CV joints do start to fail and we know that dreaded CV knocking sound that we hear, particularly when we've got a high steering angle and we're accelerating on pull-off, we hear that knocking sound. Now that's caused due to the actual ball bearings as well as the races in which they move wearing. And when that happens, we get too much movement and we get a bit of knocking noise. Now, it's at this point that you've got to be very, very careful. It's not suggested driving a vehicle with a knocking CV. And the reason for that is that the CV itself can seize, as you can imagine. And if that occurs, then we really do put ourselves in danger of a couple of things happening. The first is, is that we can cause serious damage to our transmission itself. If this seizes on the wheel hub, for example, it's going to translate through to the transmission and we can cause damage there. If it shears and the whole drive shaft pulls off, well then we've created a very dangerous missile for other road users as well as ourselves on the road. So make sure that if your CVs do start knocking that you get them sorted out. Now the good news is, is that although CVs do come as a set, so we have our outboard, our drive shaft and our inboard CV, when they knew they are pretty much quite expensive. However, if your vehicle is out of warranty, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you getting your CV joints reconditioned and they work as well as the new ones. So there you have it, the amazing CV joint that has allowed us to do so much in terms of vehicle design. It's allowed us to have front wheel drive, allowed us to have rear wheel drive vehicles with independent suspension as well as rear wheel drive vehicles with rear wheel drive steering. So that's it on today's episode of How Things Work and we look forward to you joining us next time on How Things Work.
Mr. Full, you, you never disappoint. <laughs> well, thank look, you, thank look you at, very much. That's a pleasure. Look what we've got here. We've actually got uh, the outboard CV joint. But um, what we've decided to do <laughs> is this is going to be this week's trophy for week. Our next segment. Absolutely. <laughs> so why don't we uh, introduce that? That <laughs> it, sounded, it sounded Russian when I listened to the video. Yes, um, I think maybe it was Russia's version of Flop Gear. Flop Gear. <laughs> <laughs> Their new TV program. Let's go have a look at this week's Tapper of the Week. No, that kind of Nissan Ray, which is not supposed to be on the ground. It's a Nissan Z, I think. It must be very difficult to do. Jonas will enjoy this. Jonas, oh. have a look at that. <laughs> 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 this one doesn't have a crawls out the back. What else do you see? You can't even go on. Well, once again, if uh, somebody can tell us in the comment line <laughs> who that was, we will ship this out as heavy as it is to them. This, this is uh, the only piece. <laughs> 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 All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, the first one for season three, it was absolutely brilliant to be back. Yeah, it was. And what a super guest we had as well. It's like Mark Marquez was sitting next I to I know. Him. I mean, seven-time <laughs> champion. Yeah. Uh, discuss. You want to discuss? I mean, one thing that I've got that I want to discuss. And that is, I, I seriously want to get one of the, uh, the, let's say, the Metro Police Commissioners or spokespersons yeah, yeah. to come on the show so we can grill them a little bit. Because if I see one more Metro Policeman driving without their seatbelt and talking on a cell phone, I think I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, and, and on that topic, uh, I think we've got something planned, but talking about ETOL... Talking about toll roads. Yeah, and the cost. And the cost. Whether and, it's and fair. The, and the amount of money that gets, you know, taken in on a daily basis with yeah. the toll gates. Yeah. I think that'll be a So maybe a one. shout out to Wayne Duvenage. If he's, if he's watching, maybe we can get him <laughs> on from out and, and he can come Absolutely. and talk to us about that. Right, guys. Thank you very much for joining us on Raceday.tv, on Let's Talk Automotive, on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever you were watching us. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a wonderful week. And we look forward to seeing you next week.